Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. And today we're going to talk about Franz Berwald, the Swedish composer, and in particular, his very aptly named Symphony Singulière, his third symphony. And singular, it really is. I mean, the guy was kind of, a, kind of, well, he was kind of unique, very unique. What were, what were his dates here? His dates were 1798-ish to, look at this, 1868? Wow, or 1796 to 1868? You know, I can't read these CD boxes anymore because they usually turn them like dark colors with dark print and you can't see a damn thing. Ah, here we go. 1796 to 1868. That's Franz Berwald, which means he was sort of around when Beethoven was around and you sort of died like when Berlioz and those people and Wagner were around. He, he lived for much of the, of the 19th century and wrote quite a bit of music. There are four symphonies. There's a couple of operas. There's a bunch of tone poems and some really first-class chamber music. Beautiful, beautiful chamber music, which maybe we'll have a chance to talk about in a future video. But what I really want to talk about is the Symphony Singulière. One of the reasons that Berwald is not as well known as he ought to be is that you know how you always read like in composer biographies, oh, he was musical as a child, but his parents forced him to study law or to study medicine, but he ran away and became a composer and achieved enormous fame. Berwald's life was just the opposite. His parents were musical. They trained him as a musician, but he wanted to be an orthopedist. <laughs> so he opened an orthopedic clinic in Berlin, and that's what he did for much of his life. Then he went back to Sweden, to Stockholm. And, you know, Sweden in those days, especially in the first half of the 19th century, was a very provincial backwater. Um, and and so, you know, nobody cared what happened there. Nothing basically was going on there. He taught music. He taught stuff like that. But he, he, he died with most of his works unperformed, uh, which meant that, you know, the, the, the acknowledgement of his achievement really is, is a 20th century phenomenon and only began after the turn of the 20th century. So for that reason, there wasn't much known about him and he never really entered into the central aspect of European musical life, even though living in Scandinavia and having lived in Berlin and Germany, you know, you would think that that's, that's where he would have been performed. He was a, a, a figure also who represents a very, very interesting mix of sort of the traditional and, and the innovative. Formally, he was extremely innovative. Harmonically, he was innovative. He really was the first composer whose music sounds sort of recognizably Scandinavian. You know, what we think of as Scandinavian because of its, its, its very personal approach to harmony and its orchestration with its flecks of woodwind color, you know, enlivening the instrumental textures. You listen to the music and you go, aha, you know, Scandinavia, Nordic. You know, the whole crew there, the Sibelius, Nielsen, Grieg, you know, all those guys who came later. Berfold really anticipates them. Now, let's talk about the symphonies a little bit. There are four of them. The problem is that number two, which is subtitled the Capricieux, the Capricious, is probably not the Capricieux. We don't really know exactly what happened to number two. All we know is that there was a symphony left in short score, in piano score, which was orchestrated later and given the title Capricieuse because we know he wrote a Capricieuse, but we don't know if that one is the Capricieuse and it is in any case the least interesting of the four. The others are really quite wonderful. They're really very good. Symphony number one is the Sirius. It's supposed to be serious. And symphony number four is Symphony number four in E flat, no title. But the big one, the one that's gotten all the attention is number three. And the reason it has is because it's such a fascinating work, both formally and as I said, harmonically and melodically, it's, it's, it's incredibly captivating music. The symphony plays for about 25 to 30 minutes, depending on what you do with timings. And it has three movements, but this is deceptive. It actually has a scherzo surrounded by a slow movement. 
which is one of the more interesting things about it formally. Also, the main theme of the slow movement, which is very sweetly sentimental, returns in the center of the finale. So already you can see that he's doing some very interesting things with notions of form and the relationships between movements. Just as interesting is the music's sound. I mean, it really doesn't sound like anybody else. It, you, you'll, you'll know, I'm gonna play you a sample of it. You'll know exactly what I mean. But for example, the first theme of the first movement is, is just dum bum 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 That's basically what it is. It's like two notes in a rhythm. But what makes it sound distinctive is the fact that it gets repeated with different harmonic backing. And this gives it an absolutely wonderful effect. I mean, you can't get it out of your head, but if you try and like hum it, as I just did, it comes out sounding like, like nothing. <laughs> it sounds completely useless. And so in order to actually get a sense of just how marvelous it is, you have to hear it in certain long stretches so you can hear the changing harmonic patterns that he's working with. I'm gonna play you a bit of it and and you'll you'll hear for yourself it's sort of a more extended excerpt than i usually do because i want you to hear the the entire the entire thrust of it because bearball was able to although his symphonies aren't very long they they tend to express themselves in longer sentences it's 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 part of his uniqueness as a composer listen to this isn't it? But did you notice how as the music's going bum 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 ba da da dum ba dum ba dum bum 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 what's changing is the chording, the chords behind it. And when we talk about performances of Berwald's music, you know, especially of the Third Symphony, the good ones are the ones that understand this, that understand how to bring out the woodwind sonorities and sort of the background textures because they're they're more than just accompaniment they they define what the music is it's sort of like if you're thinking theatrically it's the scenery you know that 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 frames the action that's happening in the foreground but just because it's the scenery that doesn't mean it's not important you got to be able to know you're in a forest <laughs> you're in a factory whatever the scenery is you have to be able to hear it and with that in mind, and now that you have a sense of what the piece sounds like, let's let's talk about recordings because there are some really bad ones, bad modern ones. You know, Berwald was, um, you know, since since this music has been revived, it's been recorded fairly frequently. The great lost opportunity for Third Symphony recordings was Herbert Blomstedt and the San Francisco Symphony, because he only did one in four with them. He never got to three. He probably would have ultimately finished a bear vault cycle as he did with Nielsen and Sibelius in San Francisco. And it would have been marvelous, I'm absolutely sure, but he didn't, so we don't have it. So there are two bear vault cycles you must avoid. You absolutely must avoid. The first is the Danish National Radio Symphony Orchestra with Thomas Dalsgaard. This just sucks. It's awful. Everything about it is awful. The, 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 the textures are wrong, the, the playing is slack. It's just, there's, there's, there's nothing to recommend it whatsoever. It originally appeared on Chandos. I'm not surprised they licensed it to Brilliant Classics rather quickly. 
Dalsgaard is such an odd duck as as a as an interpreter. You know, lately he sort of jumped on the period instrument bandwagon and he made all those recordings of big romantic works for chamber orchestra for bis, which are mostly appalling. Um, and now he he's in Seattle. He's done some nice things. He, he's I don't get him. I don't get him. He's he's on again, off again. Sometimes very dogmatic and and seemingly anti musical. At other times, enormously compelling. Well, the Bear Vault has him really at his worst. You do not want to get Dalsgaard's Bear Vault. You also, for lesser reasons, don't want to get Roy Goodman on Hyperion. Now, Roy Goodman, as you know, um, was the founder of the Hanover Band. He was also a big period instrument guy. The problem with his Bear Vault is that Bear Vault's a romantic composer. There's no question about it. He is a romantic composer. He's a progressive and Goodman conducts everything like he's doing the Brandenburg concertos. You know, it's all that sort of clipped, clean, fast, emotionless, <laughs> completely inexpressive. It's just, it's just, it's just not, it's not idiomatic stylistically. It's not very compelling. So, so let's leave those aside. I just want to tell you about them because they're around. They may be easy to find and you will be seriously misled if you if you decide to go for them. But I, there are some marvelous performances of Berwald's Third Symphony, not the least of which is Igor Markevich. Oh, you could just love this guy. I mean, and he did this with a Berlin Philharmonic and it's in mono, but it's a really good mono. You also get Schubert's Tragic Symphony with this. You know, he doesn't take exposition repeats. It doesn't matter. These are wonderful, 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 wonderful Berwald performances, if you hear them. And I do want to point out that I have on insider information that there are two big Markevich boxes coming from Universal, his Phillips recordings and his DG recordings. Hopefully they will be complete sometime in 2021, and those may be worth waiting for. But anyway, Markevich is where we start with Berwald. Where did Markevich hear of Berwald? I mean, the guy had just this wonderful curiosity about music of all kinds, and he played it all like gangbusters. Oh, he's such a joy. He really is. Next, the Berwald cycle that's sort of the standard that we all that we all learn these pieces from were these recordings for EMI with, with, with Ulf Björlin, Ulf Björlin and the Royal Philharmonic on EMI, now Warner. Um, this, this thing is probably out of print. You may be able to find it. I, I don't know. But uh, it, it, you get you get all kinds of stuff in here. I mean, you get all the symphonies, you get concertos, you get his tone poems. It was really a nice three disc set. I don't think the performances are the most compelling, but they're very good, and they won't steer you wrong if those are the ones you've got. However, there are two bear vault cycles, two bear vault cycles that really are worth paying attention to. Modern ones that are top notch. The first is on Naxos. It's it's really, really quite, quite fine. I'm hanging this little thing out because of the, gl the glare on the plastic. Here you go, Aku Kamu with the Helsingborg Symphony Orchestra. These are absolutely lovely performances. They're on two separate discs. So you can start with this one, which contains numbers three and four, and his piano concerto in D major, which is a wonderful romantic piano concerto. Absolutely first class. I, I don't understand why people don't play it. Maybe it's a little short or it's because it's bare bald. It's another work that was never performed until like the 20th century, but it's very, very good. So that is where the music sample I played you came from. And as you can hear, it's a dynamic and wonderful performance. And you hear those woodwinds. You really hear those woodwinds, those woodwind chords behind the tutti in the first movement. And just to prove it, I'm going to play it for you again. I want you to hear this sample again. Just listen to it again.
beautiful, beautiful. Anyway, first class. And there's another disc with the other two symphonies and, and the overture to Estrella de Soria, his tragic opera. So there you go. However, however, there is another great, great, great first class Berwald cycle, and it's available. It's on BIS. BIS did it with Sixten Erling, the superb, legendary conductor, Sixten Erling. And the, the only issue with this cycle, quite frankly, is that it's a bit expensive. I mean, it's it's two discs. It it also gets you also get the concert stuck for bassoon and orchestra, which is eleven minutes of cuteness, but um, you know it's pricey, and so that may be an issue for you. If it is, uh, then stick with Kamu on Naxos. But I'll tell you, it's it's a wonderful cycle to have. The sound is fabulous. Erling didn't make that many recordings, apparently, according to the insider dope that I always heard about Erling is that he was such a, a bastard on the podium. He was a hot tempered, nasty son of a bitch, apparently. And however compelling he was as a conductor, and he was an enormously compelling conductor that uh, he was kind of tough to get along with and difficult to deal with. And so they didn't, um, but he did have a career and, and a distinguished one. And this is, is Berwald is absolutely super, Perb in every respect. So if you're going to get Berwald, I would get Kamu and Erling with Markevich in mono as as a supplement if you can find it, or just wait for a big box of Markevich and see if it's in there, and then you're in business. If you have those older ones on, on Warner, the Burelands with the Royal Phil, you're in good shape too. And that's really that's really all you need for Berwald. There are other singleton recordings of the third floating around, but we don't need to deal with them because these are the ones that you're most likely to encounter. And those are the ones that will serve the music best. So I hope you enjoyed this encounter with Franz Berwald. There's lots more music by him that's worth exploring. If you like this symphony, you're gonna like his music generally. You really will. He had a personal style and that's what it sounds like. So if you enjoy it, then Go ahead, keep on listening. Thank you and take care.